before we get started, I just want to talk about there's a there's another there's two great events here in New Hampshire every year. One is the Liberty Forum. I shouldn't say every year. And the other is Pork Fest. And people always say, what is Liberty Forum compared to Pork Fest? I said, Liberty Forum's in a hotel and Pork Fest is camping. Drunk. With a lot of people. So last year was one of the biggest. We had, I think, over 1,200 people at Pork Fest. It was absolutely crazy. And this year, uh, Sharon Osborne, she's like, oh, thanks for calling me out. And Jason Osborne are running it. And uh, there is a sign-up sheet. You can sign up for Porkfest right now. It's June 18th through the 26th, if I remember correctly. I'll be there till the 26th. So everyone else is leaving the 24th, I guess. So it's a great time. It's a great place for you to kind of just, it's a, you know, it's just hanging out at a campsite is what I always call it, right? So it's a great time. Come on up. I think this is like the ninth or tenth one we've done. It's, you know, come to Porkfest. So one thing you might have noticed about all of our great sponsors is we always talk about a lot of precious metals, right? Because we all know our dollar's worthless. And as our dollar keeps declining more and more, I think it's actually waking up people more and more. And I always think of it as people are actually voting with their dollars, if you think about it, right? They're leaving the dollar, they're moving to other either currencies, they're moving into precious metals, maybe they're moving into commodities. And it's kind of a, you know, a vote with your dollar. And one of the things that I think is great with that Peter Schiff talks about a lot is that, you know, you can make money in these markets because it's predictable what the status and what the governments are going to do is they're going to deflate our currency or inflate our currency and they're going to make these changes that it's going to allow us to make more money. And the other thing, the, the converse part is how we vote, what we do affects prices and that. And one of the things about the Free State Project is truly voting with your feet, right? It's people who says, I'm, not, I'm sick of wherever you come from, and I'm going to move to New Hampshire to make a difference, because that's what it's all about, right? And we are truly making a difference. Someone asked me how many state reps are here, and I go, I don't know, like eight or nine? And they go, they're all free I go, no, there's like 12 free but a bunch of the whole, of those, that whole table over there, they're all native New Hampshire people. Yeah. And some of them were libertarian than the free state are, uh, representatives. Thank you, Mike Ball. So, so with that notion of voting with your feet, um, I think you're in for a real treat tonight because earlier today you heard Peter talk about money and precious metals in the market. And uh, I think he has a really great introspect about how people are going to vote with their feet and what that holds for the future of uh, the United States and our economy. So please welcome Peter Schiff. Just see a quick show of hands. How many people who are in this room were not in the room a couple of hours ago when I spoke? All right, well, how many people were in the other room? Uh, about half. All right. <laughs> well, I don't want I don't want to just say, I don't want to say it. I don't want to cover the same material I just covered, but there's some good stuff. But what I, what I do want to do is I want to talk a little bit about this topic. And I know that there were a lot of unanswered questions when I spoke earlier. So I'll try to save a lot of time for questions and, and for the people that had questions that I wasn't able to get to. If you're in this room now, I'll, I'll, I'll just lead the topic along the lines of the questions that you have. But anyway, the, this discussion is about voting with your feet. And you know, I almost voted with my feet and moved to New Hampshire years ago. I know, I know. I, I, re I regret it because I moved to Connecticut and they've already raised my taxes twice since I moved there. <laughs> and you know, a lot of people come to New Hampshire because they want to get out of a state income tax or a sales tax and they want to be freer. But they don't get away from the federal government. 
And, and so what happens if people really vote with their feet and don't just leave a state to go to New Hampshire that's somewhat less oppressive than the state that they left, but they decide to actually leave the country uh, completely. Now, I was joking. I was uh, having um, lunch with a prospective gubernatorial candidate here in your state, and we were talking about the prospect of secession, which would be very interesting, because if this was a country, I would definitely move here. <laughs> Because if, if New Hampshire was its own country, it'd be like the Liechtenstein, right, of the United States, or the, the Monaco, right? <laughs> because it'd be a, it'll be a little enclave of capitalism in a sea of socialism. And everybody would prosper, you know, the, you know and you'd get out from under the debt. You wouldn't, you know, because if, if you leave the country, you know, the debt stays with the United States. Now, you can even, you can even say, look, we'll take our share of the debt if you let us go peacefully, and then just default. I mean, what are they gonna, <laughs> what are they, what are they gonna do? <laughs> so, but the question is, you know, will, will New Hampshire have the, the guts to do something like that? Because the last time a few states tried to secede it, it didn't go very well. <laughs> and, you know, we got a lot more sophisticated weapons now, so I don't know how it would work this time around. <laughs> Yeah. But, but apart from that, right, what happens if, if people leave? And, you know, all four of my grandparents were immigrants. So I'm a second generation born in America. And why did my parents come here? I mean, my grandparents, why did they come here? They came here because they were looking for freedom. When they came here, there was no income tax. There was no Social Security tax. There were pretty much no taxes to speak of. There were some tariffs, but I mean, who cared about those? I mean, it was no big deal. Uh, so they were free. I mean, my grandparents came here, they didn't even speak English. And there was no welfare workers. When they, when they showed up on Ellis Island, there was nobody there to meet them. There was no welfare, there was no food stamps. If they didn't have a job, they didn't eat. Yet, they managed to succeed. And why did they leave where they were? Because they didn't have the freedom and the opportunity that we had here. See, immigrants weren't a problem. See, we had a lot more immigrants coming to this country 100 years ago than we do now. They were flooding in. But it was great. There was no, I mean, you know, when I ran for the U.S. Senate, that was always a big hot button issue. Every time I spoke, I always was getting questions about the immigrants. And it's still a big issue today. In, in, the, in the presidential debates. You know, I'll just let you guys in on this because it's probably not gonna happen, but I might as well tell you. <laughs> but I, I got a call today from the, a producer of Fox. Fox is having a, a new a, a debate a week from tomorrow. That, well, they just put it together, a presidential debate. And there's gonna be three panelists that were gonna ask the questions of the candidates. And they called me up and asked me if I would be one of the panelists. <laughs> But, but I had to tell the producer that I was a Ron Paul supporter, and I wasn't sure how well that would go over with the other participants. And so he's going to go run it by him and see if... if. <laughs> so I, suffice to say, I doubt they're going to want me to ask them questions. But I would love to ask some questions to Romney, uh, Gingrich, and, and Santorum. I already know the questions I ask. But, but anyway, but th this immigration is, is a big deal. And I never liked the immigration topic because I always thought it was a scapegoat. People trying to blame the immigrants for our problems. And we had a lot more immigrants, as I said, 100 years ago, and it wasn't a problem. It was great. The difference is the immigrants that came here when my grandparents came, came for opportunity. There are people coming now coming for a handout. And that's the problem. It's not the immigrants. It's the social welfare state that is making the problem a problem. But the reality is, a lot of the immigrants that are coming here are working. I had someone on my radio show just yesterday, and if you don't know, I have a radio show called The Peter Schiff Show. And I have this show every, every two hours a day at shiftradio.com, so tune in. It's free, and if you can listen live or you can listen to it delayed. 
But anyway, she went undercover working in California, uh, picking fruit. And I asked her, you know, I said, well, were there any other Americans out, you know, picking fruit with you? She said, no, I was the only one. Because everybody else was Mexican. And the only reason she took the job was because it was part of her research for her book. You know, I asked her, you know, did they think it was odd that an American was actually taking his job? And this was in California at a time when the unemployment rate was over 10%. Yet no one in America would actually go and even interview for a job. Why would they bother when they can get unemployment benefits? Why pick fruit in the hot sun when you can collect uh, unemployment benefits in the shade? But she went out there just, just for research, looking for work. So a lot of the immigrants that are coming here are, are actually a net benefit. I mean, probably if you can push a button and make all the immigrants disappear, illegal and legal, we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> you know, I mean, people talk about immigrants taking our jobs. You know, there are a lot of people that wouldn't have jobs if it wasn't for illegal immigrants. A lot of people in California, a lot of mothers wouldn't be able to work if they had to pay for childcare at the rates that the Americans would charge. And in fact, there are a lot of companies that if they didn't have the illegals, they would have to shut down. And so a lot of the legals who have decent jobs would lose them because we'd end up importing the products instead without that labor. So people don't understand the contribution that some of the immigrants are making, not that others are not a drain. But the problem is that some of them are coming here for a handout and not opportunity like my grandparents. But we are not the country that my grandparents came to. I mean, not even, not even close. Many countries around the world are freer than America. You know, we have high taxes. There are many countries that have lower taxes than we do. And we have a lot of government, and we have a huge deficit, which means the likely path of taxes in the future is up. I mean, we have a lot of debt. And if we don't default on it or inflate it away, someone's going to have to pay it. And that's going to mean higher taxes, particularly for younger people. Because the younger people, people in their 20s, you know, 30s, they're the ones that are left holding the bag for the Social Security Ponzi scheme. You've got generations of Americans who are expecting you to support them. In addition, you've got to pay interest on the debt. You've got to pay for the national defense. There's not going to leave much left over right, for people to spend on themselves. Plus, a lot of young Americans are entering the workforce with, you know, with mortgages, with no, no houses. They have student loans. 50,000, 100,000. I had a young lady on my show had a four-year degree in, in sociology and $190,000 in student loans to get a sociology degree. Of course, she can't even get a job with that degree, but she's, she's got these loans. So you've got a lot of generations of Americans who are stuck with loans that they can never repay. There's not a lot of good jobs out there. And if they get a job, a good chunk of their money is going to go to the government. And a, and a bigger chunk is going to go to the government in the future. And of course, we're not really attracting anymore as many of the types of immigrants like my grandparents, because we don't have that comparative advantage in, in freedom. We have less freedom, we have higher taxes than a lot of other countries. And at minimum, we're about the same. I mean, we're not much different than Europe. But at one point, we had such a massive lead, it wasn't even close how much freer people were. And that's why America became so wealthy. It wasn't an accident that we became wealthy. We became wealthy for a reason. We embraced freedom and liberty and capitalism like no other country in the history of the world. And that was responsible for our wealth and for our success. Unfortunately, we abandoned those principles in the 20th century, and we're suffering for it now. You know, I mentioned uh, at my talk earlier, and it, was, it surprises a lot of people, so I like this statistic, especially when I heard all the, you know, the, the, the Occupy Wall Street people trying to claim that, oh, the 1%, the, the rich, they owe their wealth because of society, because of government, because of all the things government does and the taxes that everybody else pays. That's the only reason that people are rich, and so they should be more than happy to give a little back, as if they're not paying enough in taxes already. But 
during the, the 19th century, before we had all this government, right, I look back at the 30 wealthiest Americans, self-made. These are not the people that inherited their money, but started from scratch and made their wealth. If you adjust it for inflation, of the wealthy, 30 wealthiest Americans in history, including all the ones that are alive today, all the dot-com millionaire, billionaire, all the guys around today, of the, the 30 wealthiest Americans, only three, only three were bro born after the Civil War. That's it, three. And of those three, only one was born after the Second World War. So, I mean, the country is going downhill. And these people, and many of them didn't even go to college. Most of the people who were the wealthiest Americans, they didn't go to college. Some of them didn't go to high school. Yet they, ex they, they achieved wealth you know, that nobody even, a lot, no one today can compare to the wealth that some of these people amassed. And they did it by sharing their success with an entire nation. They created products. They created the Industrial Revolution. They transformed society. We were a bunch of farmers, you know, and, and, and we, we became an industrial society. People were living in cities. Because of the wealth that these men achieved in a free market, not only did they create all these products, but they created jobs. So many jobs that tens of millions of immigrants were coming in and nobody was unemployed. And all that was done with freedom, with sound money, with gold standard, with deflation, all the things that the government says we don't want, that's what we had. And that's why we became successful. But today, we don't have any of those advantages. In fact, we have a lot of disadvantages. And I, I think that we have a real threat that if we stay on the course that we're on, that the next major wave of immigration is not going to be coming in, but emigration going out. In fact, another thing that happened when I was running for Senate, and again, they still talk about this now, today, is everybody would say, we want, what about a wall? Let's build a wall on the southern border to keep the Mexicans out. And I always had the same answer why I was opposed to building that wall. Because I said, look, we may build it to keep the Mexicans out, but we're going to use it to keep the Americans in. And people would think, well, no, why would anybody ever want to leave? Look, when I had that girl on my radio show, that young lady, and she asked me for her adv advice, you know what my advice was? Leave the country. That's your only hope. Because otherwise, you're stuck with that debt. If you leave the country, good luck getting it. But if you work anywhere in America, they're going to take that student loan. I mean, it was such a big payment, she was stuck. And there are a lot of people that are going to be looking at this you know, the, the perspective. And I know at one point at our universities, they had polls. And then, what do you want to do? And these are the top universities. And for a while, everybody wanted to go to Silicon Valley. That's where they all, they all wanted to get jobs in tech. And then all of a sudden, they all wanted jobs on Wall Street. Right? They wanted to go to Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. You know what they want to do now? They want to go to Shanghai. Like they want to leave the country. This, the top talent wants to leave. And you know, I've been traveled around the world and there are plenty of places now where there's no income taxes outside the United States. And, you, and, and there are people from all around the world working there. You know who everybody feels sorry for? You know the people who have the most problems working abroad? It's Americans. You see, America is about the only country in the world where the price of citizenship is you got to pay income taxes on anything you earn, no matter where you are. See, every other country says, look, if you earn money in another country, we don't want any of it. Keep it. It's only if you earn the money in their country they tax you. So if you go down to, let's say, the Bahamas, where there's no income tax, and there's a bunch of Canadians that are living there, they're working, they're living tax free. The Americans are paying income taxes, right? And so an American citizenship used to be an asset. Now it's a liability. In fact, it's an enormous liability. It cost a fortune to get rid of it. It didn't used to cost anything to get rid of it. But if you want to renounce your U.S. citizenship now and you have a lot of wealth, you're going to pay a huge tax. And more importantly, even if you're young, this is something that's pretty interesting. And it shows you that the government is trying to get ahead of this. I think it was about within a month, the government decided to impose a fee on getting the form to renounce your citizenship. 
It used to be free. So if you wanted to renounce your citizenship, you just ask for a form. And if you didn't have any money, if you're just a 22, 23 year old kid, just fill it out and you can, you know, you can go through the process of renouncing your citizenship. Now that form costs $450. I think it's the most expensive form you can request. Now, is that, I mean, do you think it costs $450 to, you, to, to photocopy that form? <laughs> so, I mean, what is this telling you? And here's the thing, if they can charge $450 for that form, they can charge $5,000 for that form. They can charge $10,000 for that form, right? And wh what are they thinking? You know what they're thinking is we got a lot of young kids who we need to tax the hell out of if we're gonna keep our promises to the people who are waiting to collect Social Security, we can't let them leave, right? They know that. So they're trying to figure out now, and of course, you know, the next step is, well, what if, what if you can't afford the form? Well, I mean, what if, what, if you, what if you have to sneak out? That's why I was worried about that, mall, that wall. Because some Americans, look, I mean, why, why was it that the Soviet Union had to put a wall, you know, build a wall to keep the people, because they didn't want to stay, because they, they knew there was better opportunity. See, when you, when, when you have an oppressive society, you've got to keep the people in, because otherwise they're going to leave. And that is the direction that we're headed. How is America going to keep young people here if we're taxing them to death? I mean, if you think about it, I mean, look at where Social Security is right now. Social Security is already paying out more in taxes than it collects in revenue. So the Ponzi scheme is already collapsing. And the only people that can be taxed are the young people who are still working. But they can do the math. They know they don't have a prayer of ever collecting anything. But how high are the taxes gonna have to be? You have tens of trillions of dollars of unfunded Social Security and, and Medicare liabilities. Who's gonna pick them up? You know, the government is now spending $1.40 for every dollar it collects in taxes. It can't do that in perpetuity. Right now, it's, it's paying for it with inflation. It's printing money. So it's not taking our money. It's just taking the value from our money. It's spending our purchasing power. And as a result, we have to pay more money for everything we buy. You know, you hear there's a lot of reports now about record high gasoline prices. And people are saying, well, it's because of uh, Iran. It's got nothing to do with Iran. It's because of Washington. It's because of Obama. It's because of Bernanke. It's because of Congress. The high oil prices are a tax. And that tax is going to get higher and higher and higher as more money has to be printed to buy all these bonds because the government isn't collecting enough in taxes to pay for everything that it's spending. But at some point, there will be a limit to how much inflation they can create. You know, and it's either going to have to be slashing spending or raising taxes. And if they raise taxes, who is it going to hit? And of course, as they raise taxes too on the 1%, right? The, the people who actually own all the businesses and take all the risks and grow the economy and produce the goods and provide the services and create the jobs, as you make it more expensive for employers to hire people, what are you going to do to all the employment opportunities? They're just going to vanish. In fact, if you look at the labor force participation rate, it's at historic lows. I think there are fewer men in the labor force today than there were at the end of the Second World War. I mean, why is it all these men aren't working? Are they so rich that they don't have to? They just retired? No, they, they can't find jobs. And this is going to get worse. I mean, one of the reasons now that you don't have as big an, Im an illegal immigration problem is they don't want to come here anymore because there's no jobs, right? They, they, people used to come here and work and they send their money home. If there's no jobs here, they're not going to come. So even the illegals are having a hard time finding jobs. So all the opportunity is, is going away. We're losing our individual liberties. And part of the problem is as the U.S. government continues to grow and expand its influence and micromanage and centrally plan and central bank the economy, right? It destroys all the growth, all the opportunity, creates all these problems, and then as the government interference in the economy makes it weaker, 
The solution is always, well, we need more government. Look at all these problems. Obviously, we need more government to solve them, even though it's the government intervention that created the problems. And more government doesn't solve them. It just compounds them. So we've got this situation where more and more people will view America as a sinking ship. And what are they going to do about it? Now, I, I work with a lot of people in my brokerage firm or my precious metals company who have financial wealth. And I'm helping them protect that wealth from inflation, from a collapse of the dollar. But younger people, they don't have any financial wealth. They haven't had a chance to earn it yet. And if they stay here, they're never going to earn it because they don't have the opportunity. The businesses aren't there. It's too expensive to hire people. You know, I'm, you know I have a much, it's much easier for me to hire people in my foreign business. I got a bank uh, offshore that where I'm expanding and hiring people. It's a lot easier to do that. The government has made it very expensive and very difficult for me to hire people in America. You know, every, you know the, 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 almost the worst thing you can do in America is, is, is give someone a job, is be an employer. Because the minute you're an employer, you're, you just got a bullseye you know, right on your back and the government starts shooting at you. Because the minute you're an employer, you, you lose all kinds of rights. Because we have bent over backwards in America to say, if you're an employee, you get all kinds of employee rights. Well, they're not really rights, they're privileges that are granted to employees, but they're at the expense of the person who is unfortunate enough to employ them. So what the government says, if you want to employ somebody, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do the other thing, and you got to pay for it. And if you don't do it exactly the way we say, we're going to fine you, and in fact, you can get sued and it's gonna cost you a fortune. So a lot of people decide, you know what? Screw this, I'm not hiring anybody. I can't afford to. I can't take the liability. Even if it means I make less money, I don't want the aggravation. I don't want the liability. And those people that do hire, they try to have, their, they have, they try to have as few employees as possible because some of the laws that apply to employers only apply to you as you hire more people. So some laws will say it applies to employers that have five or more employees. Okay, so you have four. Get out from under that. Just don't hire a fifth. Sometimes it's, oh, it's 50 or more. So companies will go out of their way to try to minimize their number of employees so that they can stay you know, outside the reach of these new regulations or new requirements. And so what does that do? That diminishes the opportunities for young people. You've also got a lot of occupational licensing laws here that make it harder for young people uh, to get an opportunity. You've got minimum wage laws that make it hard for young people to get that first job, to acquire any skills. And of course, when a lot of Americans are graduating, you know, and they're not even entering the workforce until they're 22, 23, they miss out on the opportunity to get a job at 16 or 17 or 18 because either it's illegal or some, that they, they were persuaded by, you know, guidance counselors or just, you know, pressure to go to college. And, and today the idea is that, well, look, just go to college. Doesn't matter what you study. Doesn't matter if you learn anything. You just have to go. It's kind of like a rite of passage. You can spend, now it's like five or six years to get a four-year degree, but it doesn't matter. You can major in any kind of Mickey Mouse major they want, you know, comparative philosophies or whatever it is. And, and basically all it is, is, is it's this one big party. You know, you, 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 you borrow a lot of money and, and you get drunk, you go to parties, you drink beer, and, and eventually you graduate. And, and, and now here you are, you're loaded up with debt and you, you have no marketable skills. I mean, you wasted some of the best years of your life. I mean, maybe you had a good time, but you should have been learning a skill. You should have been learning a trade. You should have been out in the workforce learning skills, improving, you know, what you, your human capital, you know, but no, we just sent all, sent all our kids off to, to one big party and, and now they graduate. And they can't take these entry level jobs, even if they were there, because they can't afford to. They got too much debt, you know, and they, they, they can't take these opportunities because they just assume not even work, because if they work, I mean, think about the marginal tax rate, because if you don't work, well, you're not going to pay those student loans. But the minute you start to work, not only do you have to pay the taxes on the money you earn, but now you got to start making payments on these loans. The minute, and the loans come out after tax. And, you know, there's not a lot left. So we, we are, are creating a situation 
where we're destroying our youth. And of course, the only reason, and I, I get into this discussion quite a bit, but the only reason that college is so expensive is because the government subsidizes it. You know, and if the government didn't subsidize it, yes, fewer people would go to college and that would be a good thing. We got too many people in college. You know, when, when the woman that was on my show was doing her undercover work, she also got a job at, at like the Olive Garden or Red Lobster, you know, working in the kitchen, like, you know, busing. And so, she, but I said, well, how did you get the job? She had to fill out a resume. And on her resume, she, you know, put her, you know, she was a college graduate. And of course she applied for a job, you know, as a dishwasher. And I said, well, did they think that was a little odd that here you were a college graduate and you were applying for this dishwasher job? She said, no, most people there had college degrees. I mean, you know, so we're wasting our time, you know, say, you know, educating our kids to have a, you know, a, a philosophy degree so they can bust tables at a restaurant. I mean, so, I mean, obviously they can do that without a college degree, but the key is, you know, if people didn't spend all that time in college, they might've actually learned on the job and they would have some skills and they wouldn't have all this debt. But so we're screwing up our kids. They're graduating with all this debt. The opportunities are vanishing. The employment opportunities are vanishing. Meanwhile, in other countries, they're discovering that the, the values that we've abandoned. People that were oppressed, oppressed are winning their freedoms. I don't know that there's any place in the world that is as free as we were when my grandparents came, but there are plenty of places in the world that are a lot freer than we are right now. And at least there, the pendulum is swinging in the right direction. It's moving towards freedom, away, away from tyranny. We're going the other way. And so people could read the white writing on the wall. Say, wait a minute, we're going like this in that direction and the other countries, where do you want to go? And so this is something that I think is going to happen. I think we could start seeing more of this because as I talked about earlier today, and then I'm going to take your questions about what I was speaking about, but I think the real economic crisis is coming. I don't think, I don't think we've had it yet. And I think what's going to happen in this country is going to be horrific. It's going to be like what's happening in Greece, only a lot worse. And that is going to be an environment that is very dangerous to live in. And it's going to be very dangerous for our freedoms or what's left of them. Because the government is able to usurp power in times of chaos, right? When, when, when there's fear, right? That's when they're able to, all of the, all of the, the big, growth of government has always come when there is a war. You know, you, you can joke that we lost every war because every time there was a war, we lost our freedoms, right? It was the first world war that, that, that gave us the estate tax, the gift tax. It actually gave us the, the, the Federal Reserve didn't even have the authority to buy treasuries until the first world war. When they established the Federal Reserve, it was illegal for them to own U.S. Treasuries. They changed that during the First World War because the government wanted to borrow money and finance it through the Federal Reserve. So they went in and, you know, that's when they actually, you know, the debt ceiling that they keep raising, that's when they put in the debt ceiling. Because the minute they said that the, the government can borrow from the Fed, they wanted to have a debt ceiling to make sure they didn't borrow too much. And the first debt ceiling was, you know, really, the problem is they, 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 they didn't make it a permanent ceiling. Right, it, it was, they raised it. But um, we got, we actually we got the first paper money in the Civil War and the first income tax actually started in the Civil War, but they repealed it when the war was over, but they resurrected it. And the first withholding tax came in in, in, the, in the Second World War. It was called the victory tax. It came in 1942. No American paid income taxes. No average American paid any income taxes until the Second World War. And, and that's when we got that. But the government needs all the money because there's a war on, and then the war is over and they keep the money, and then they find other ways to spend it. I mean, look at all the rights we've lost now with the war on terror. You think the government would have been able to pass the Patriot Act if we didn't have a war on terror? Not, you know, not especially my brokerage firm. You know, the, pa the Patriot Act has turned my brokerage firm, we're actually a combination of an FBI office and an IRS agency but we don't get paid. It costs me a fortune to spy on all my clients, but that's what I have to do. So if you do open up an account with me, you know, 
just realize, be careful what you say. Because all the brokers are, you know, they, they train us. We have all kinds of training, continuous education. I have, I'm constantly having my brokers watching films on the internet about how to spot, you know, this suspicious activity, right? And it's all about terrorists, supposedly, but if you actually look at it, it's all about one thing, tax evasion. That's all it is. It's all about looking at every one of our clients, everything they do, everything they say, to try to find somebody that might exhibit a behavior that looks like maybe they have unreported income. And what we have to do with that money, in information, we've got to tell the government. And you know, we can't tell the customers. If we tell the customers, that's a crime. And if we don't report the suspicious behavior, that's a crime. In fact, if we don't demonstrate to the government that we have the proper protesters to find the this, this, this suspicious activity, that's a crime. And I think the maximum penalty is a $2 million fine and 20 years in jail. So do you, you think the government could have got that through in peacetime without a war on terror? So, you know, I mean, that's where we lose all of our rights. So if we have this real economic crisis, that's going to be worse than 2008, where there's civil unrest, where there's food shortages, energy shortages, because the dollars collapsed. Maybe we have price controls. The government, if, if all hell is breaking loose, who knows what's going to happen? And a lot of people are not going to want to just ride it out. They're going to, they're going to want to leave. And and, and when that starts to happen, I mean, that's, that kind of unravels the society because who leaves? The best, the, the, most, the most ambitious, the hardest working, right? I mean, because it takes something to pick up and leave to go to another country. Now, the people who are leaving already are the children of immigrants. I mean, you have a lot of Chinese Americans who are going back to China, you know, because they have family there, they know the language, they know the culture. And their parents came here for opportunities and they're leaving for the same reason. And people who are working abroad, they get there, you know, they can communicate with their friends who are still here on the internet and they can tell them, hey, everything is great over here. Plenty of jobs, you know, lots of freedom. And so people, I got, I have, I had a bunch of people and I have 14 people. I got people who are leaving the country and they were just thrilled to do it. I had more resumes than I can handle who are leaving the country to go work for my offshore bank. And, you know, at least they get to keep, they can work offshore as Americans, the first like 85,000 they earn is tax free. And then, and then they have to start paying taxes, but, but at least, you know, they, they get a little bit of a, but the people who are working offshore, we don't have any of these requirements that we have in America. So my brokers in America spend a third of their time, maybe more, just on compliance. It, it, it takes, a, I mean, I've had people that quit because they can't take it. They just look at it, they, they leave the industry. A lot of firms have just failed because it's, they, they can't even afford what the government, you know, I used to have brokers that worked from home. We had to get rid of them all because the government says you can't have people working from home. Now, wait a minute. I mean, I thought we we're supposed to try to telecommute, you know, save on gas. You tell me I can't have an employee. I can't have a mother who has a kid. No, no, no. So they got to go to the office every day. You can't have them working at home. So, I mean, but I can have them working at home if they're, in, if they're offshore, my, my foreign company. And, you know, and the supervision and the things that we have to do, you know, sometimes the clients can't take it. They, 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 they get, you know, they, they have all these new rules now on customer complaints. And of course, so if you do become a customer, please don't complain. <laughs> because it used to be if, if you had a complaint that was in writing, right? If you had a complaint that was in writing, you had to report it. But if it was a verbal complaint, you just had to deal with it, which any business would deal with a complaint. Nobody wants a client who's not happy. Uh, so of course we, we, we deal with complaints. But it had to be in writing before you had to bring it to the, the, the regulators and, and, and explain what you were doing and how you resolved it. Well, once the internet came in, all complaints are in writing because people email you all the time. Well, I mean, if you email, but, but now they consider everything a complaint. It, ha, it could be, I, I was on hold too long. I, you know, I didn't like the music that you were playing. You know, I, ha, I, have pro, I, I couldn't get into my account. My password's not working. You know, I, 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 you know, I couldn't, I, you know, I, I didn't like the tie that Peter was wearing 
on, on, on that show. You, I had a, we had a complaint the other day. The guy complained that you, you spelled my name wrong on the, on, 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 the, on the envelope. I don't understand my statement. Where's my ch dividend check? Anything where somebody is upset about something is now a complaint. And it, it takes three, it takes hours of our time. We've got to, and in fact, one of the biggest complaints we have is about the compliance. People complain about the things that we ask them to do that we don't even want them to do. But the government forces us to do it and then they complain about it and now we gotta file that. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a whole compliance department now. I don't know, I got maybe 10 guys that do nothing but compliance. That's all they do. You know, I mean, for three years, the government wouldn't let me hire anybody, even if I wanted to. The only people they let me hire were compliance people. But of course, I don't want to hire them. They don't produce anything. They just make everybody else less productive, and I got I to gotta pay their salary. So this is going on all around the country. Businesses are just folding. I mean, you want to know why there's so much outsourcing. That's why. I mean, not only, you know, is it, is it less expensive because the wages are lower, but the regulations the compliance costs. You know, so obviously, I mean, we've already exported our jobs. The next thing is our people. Because if I say, you want to get a job, well, go to China, because that's where they are. You know, and, that, and, that's, and it's not because of, um, you know, of the wages, in many cases, it's the regulations. And, you know, the problem is people say, well, you know, China's a communist country. Yeah, well, I mean, America, is not a capitalist country. So the reality is there's more capitalism in communist China than there is here. So China is giving communism a good name and we're giving capitalism a bad name because people look at it and say, look, look at all the economic growth in China. Well, I guess communism works. Well, no, it doesn't because look at us. I mean, if it worked, I mean, if you remember the Soviet Union, that was a communist country. They exported nothing. The, 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 the Russians couldn't even feed themselves. We had to give them grain every year. We had to loan them money to buy grain, otherwise they would have starved. That's a communist country. Right? China is not communist. Right? You, you think communists could produce all this stuff that's on the shelves in Walmart? Not on your life. The, I mean, the, the Russians, the only thing the Russians, the only thing all the Russians ever made was an AK-47. That's all they came up with. That was it. And the only other thing they exported, they exported caviar and fur because it was, they caught, it was nature. They didn't make anything. They couldn't figure out how to make anything. Don't forget vodka. Well, vodka, yeah, vodka. But, I mean, that is where we're headed. And, you know, the government can claim, you know, we got all these unemployed people. One of the things the Soviet Union was always able to do is always able to say, we have no unemployment. Nobody in the Soviet Union was unemployed because they all work for the government. But they, but they had to wait in line six hours to get a loaf of bread. Why? Well, because everybody was working for the government. Nobody was making any bread. I mean, just working for the government doesn't mean anything. See, we're always thinking, well, we have to, we have to create jobs. No, we don't. The idea is to eliminate jobs. We want to create stuff. We want to create leisure. That's better than working. That's what the politicians don't understand. That's why people prefer an unemployment check to a crappy job. Because they'd rather have leisure. Right? Leisure is fun. Picking fruit is not. But if you don't have the option, well, you'll pick fruit. But government jobs don't make us richer. They make us poorer because they don't produce anything. They have, to be, they have to be supported by the people who do produce. People forget that a job is not an ends in and of itself. Nobody wants a job. I mean, at least not most people. There are some people that really like their work, but the vast majority of Americans, if they can quit their job and still get paid, they do it, right? So you don't want the job. You want the things that you can buy with the money that you earn because you have a job. So that is the goal, that is the ends, the job is the means. And of course, you have to produce things. We don't want the work, we don't want the effort, we want the results, we want the productivity that was the end product of that labor. So if we're all working, 
but you know, half of us are digging ditches and the other half are filling them back up again. Those jobs are a waste. At the end of the day, you've got nothing to show for them because you filled in the holes. But people spent all day digging, right? And we got nothing. Meanwhile, what weren't they doing because they were digging holes and filling them up? They weren't making stuff. They weren't doing things. And this is the society that we're creating. Government make work, uh, you know, service sector, inflation, regulation, taxation, you know, vilifying. You've got this attitude now, this 99% versus the 1%. You know, we need to raise taxes because it's fair. You know, what would be fair if we didn't, if the 1% if the didn't have to pay taxes at all? That'd be fair. I mean, think about the, I'm not talking about the guy that's working on Wall Street. That, 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 that got bailout money. I mean, no, I mean, they're giving everybody else a bad name. But, you know, the people that, that run, run companies, I was trying to explain to my son, who's nine years old, how it is I make money. Because he said, so he, he, he was talking to his friend and he, told, he said that, so daddy, you, you don't have a boss, right? You're the boss. I said, right. And I said, well, who pays you? I said, well, nobody pays me. Well, how do you make money? I said, well, the way I make money is I pay everybody else first. I pay all my employees. I pay all my rent. I pay all the regulatory costs. I pay all the legal costs. I pay every bill that comes on my desk. And only if there's anything left over, after all those bills are paid, after all those people are paid, if there's anything left over, then I get that. And if there's nothing left over, I get nothing. And if, the, and if the expenses exceed what comes in, I gotta write a check and I gotta put it into the business, right? So the people who are running the businesses, who are taking the risks, who are working the long hours to make this whole economy go, the fact that they have to pay any taxes at all, because everything they do is benefiting the country. The, the services that they provide, the goods that they produce, the jobs that they create, that's what benefits society. In fact, any money that they send to the government in taxes is money they could have used to grow the economy. It's money they could have used uh, to expand their businesses. You know, why would we want the brightest, the most innovative people in this country to take their hard-earned money and send it to Washington? What are they going to do with it? They're just going to blow it. Why not leave it in the hands of the people who are bright enough to earn it in the first place and let them reinvest it? You know, that's the beauty of a, like a consumption-based tax system. When I talked about, hey, I, I want to get rid of the income tax and just have a sales tax, people would always say, well, that's terrible because the rich wouldn't have to pay as much because they don't, they, they, they don't spend all their income. I know they don't, and that's a good thing because if they spent all their income, we'd all be broke, right? Where do the jobs come from? The jobs come from the money that isn't spent. Where does the capital come from? Where does the investment come from? It's from the money that isn't spent. So why do we want to tax that money? If you're a rich person, you know, Warren Buffett complains all the time that he doesn't pay enough taxes, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, although first of all, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. He's lying. Warren Buffett, when he talks about the fact that he doesn't pay taxes, less than 1% of his income is earned as an individual. Just less than 1%. 99 plus percent of his money is earned through his corporation, Berkshire Hathaway. Warren Buffett owns a third of the stock. They pay 35% tax. They pay billions of dollars a year in taxes. That's Warren's money. A third of it is his. So he chooses to pay it through his corporation. And of course, if the corporation does pay a dividend to Warren Buffett, he pays another 15% tax on that. So his real tax rate is 50%. So when he says he's only paying 15%, he's paying less than his secretary, he's lying. And in fact, when he says he wants to pay more taxes, he's lying about that too. <laughs> Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett pays himself a salary of $500,000 a year. That's less than the salary I pay myself. He's a billionaire. I'm not. Why does Warren Buffett work so cheap? Because he doesn't want to pay the taxes. You see, if Warren Buffett paid himself a big salary, he would have to pay a lot of money in taxes on it, like I do. 
he would have to pay 35% federal and he'd have to pay the, I'm not sure what the taxes are in Omaha, but he'd have to pay those. He'd have to pay the Medicare tax, right? All those taxes. So he doesn't do that. He leaves it in the company where he owns a third of it. And get this, he's actually a lot smarter. Warren, Berkshire Hathaway trades at 20 times earnings. That's the PE. So every dollar that Warren Buffett doesn't pay himself in salary adds $20 to the value of Berkshire Hathaway stock. Now, if he owns a third of it, that's $7 for Warren. So if he doesn't pay himself a dollar, he's $7 richer. And now when he sells that stock, guess what his tax rate is? 15%, right? So Warren Buffett is going out of his way to arrange his income to minimize his taxes. Then he goes and cries that he's not paying enough taxes and he wants the government to raise them. He can raise his taxes anytime he wants. Just pay himself a salary or just write a check to the government. But back to what I really wanted to talk about. Look, Warren, Warren might not be the best economist and he might not be that savvy in politics, but he's obviously a good businessman. He's made a lot of money. He's run a lot of companies successfully. Who do you want? to have Warren's money? Warren or Barack Obama? Warren. I mean, what is he going to do with it? Put more money into another Solyndra? You think Warren Buffett would have bought Solyndra stock? <laughs> and Warren Buffett has all this money. The guy drives a pickup truck. He lives in a little house. I mean, he's not an extravagant guy. Now, when these people say, we need to raise tax, you know, we can't let the rich have a consumption tax, right? Because then they're not gonna pay taxes because they're only gonna pay taxes on the money they spend. Well, yeah, because that's the only money that benefits them. See, if Warren Buffett is earning hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and he's earning hundreds of millions of dollars a year, if he spent it all, well, then he would pay a big consumption tax. But if he only spends a little bit of it, then what is he doing with the money that he's not enjoying? Well, he's using it to grow his business. He's growing the economy. Why should the government tax that money? See, they always say we need to tax, when we want to have a tax cut, right, to stimulate the economy, they say, well, we need to cut taxes on the middle class because they'll spend all that money. See, if we cut taxes on the rich, well, they won't spend it. Yeah, they'll invest it. They'll grow the economy. They'll create jobs. They'll create products. That's what we want. We don't want to tax savings. We want to tax spending because spending doesn't grow the economy. Spending is the consequence of a growing economy. You have to grow it. You have to produce it before you consume it, right? You have, so that's what comes first. So if you have somebody who's very rich, who is only spending a small amount of their income, they're like a benefactor, right? Because their wealth is benefiting everybody but them. Now you can say, yes, but they're getting really rich on paper. All right, but what good is it doing them? They, they can't enjoy it until they spend it. And you'll say, well, what if they die? All right, well, then their kids are going to spend it. Somebody's going to spend it eventually. And if nobody ever spends it, well, then great. It's their loss and society's gain. Because when you earn money, that's what you're putting into the pot. Spending is when you're taking out. And so if you're always putting in and never taking out, you're really not getting any enjoyment for yourself. But anyway, my, my point of this is we're punishing the employers, the job creators, the innovators, and if we do that, A, they're gonna leave, and B, if they're not here, who's gonna pr provide jobs for people who aren't innovative, who aren't that ambitious, who just wanna earn a decent living? Well, if we chase out the entrepreneurs, there's nobody left to employ those people. So the entrepreneurs go and the workers have to follow because they have to go where the opportunities are. They have to go where the taxes are. And that's where freedom is. Just like some people will move to New Hampshire and leave uh, New York or New Jersey because they want lower taxes and more freedom, people will leave New Hampshire and go to another country for the same reason. And if the businesses go, the workers will follow. Anyway, let me take some questions if we have time. I didn't even know how long I was going to talk because I really didn't know what I was going to say until I got up here. Because <laughs> I, 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 already gave, I, already, I already gave my talk. But let me try to take some questions that are left over from, from earlier today. Yeah. Uh, do you have countries that you 
Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of countries. I mean, first of all, I mean, you can just, I mean, even Canada, right to our north, it, it, and, but, you know, you can go to Australia or New Zealand. I mean, there's a lot of freedom there. Uh, I'm very optimistic. A lot of the Asian countries, you know, if you go to Singapore, you go to Hong Kong, I mean, even if you, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of economic freedom there. But, you know, even in parts of Europe, I mean, you can go to Switzerland. I mean, you can go even even some of the Scandinavian countries are moving in the right uh, direction. So, you know, even down countries in, in South America, um, you know, freedom is contagious. It works. And, you know, it's happening. As I said, you know, I don't think there's any country, any major country that is as free as we used to be. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of them that are freer than we are now. And as I said, what's scary is the direction and the rate at which we're losing what liberty remains. I mean, we created in this country a very small, limited federal government whose powers were clearly defined and enumerated in the Constitution uh, and Article One, Section 8. And there's, there's very little that the government was supposed to do. Now the government is pretty much, you know, all powerful, does whatever the hell it wants. There's no limit to government power. And now there's no limit to government tyranny now, right? With the government, if, if, if they think you're, you're a terrorist, they can just pick you up, throw you in jail, and throw away the key, no trial, no lawyer. And of course, be, the definition of terrorist, I think, is anybody who thinks we should be on a gold standard, or anybody who has more than one week's worth of food stored in their house. I mean, there's all sorts of, you know. So I mean, you know, the, 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 our freedoms are just vanishing very quickly. And so, you know, pretty soon it's going to be, well, you know, you can pretty much go anywhere and, 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 be, uh, and, and be better off. And that's why it could get very hard to get out of the country. It could be expensive to get out. I mean, that's why we have a lot of clients. We sell physical gold here for delivery, but we also have a program where we store the gold in Australia for you uh, through the Perth Mint. And the reason that we do that is because if it ever becomes to the point where you need to flee, chances are they won't let you take your gold with you. And unless you want a chance smuggling it out, and who knows, maybe it'll be the death penalty if they catch you taking gold out of the country. Uh, you know, it's already illegal to take, you can't take dimes, I mean, pennies or nickels out of the country in, in bulk, it's illegal. You know why? Because they're afraid you're gonna melt them down because they're worth more than the, than the face. So it's illegal to take them out of the country. But they, who knows what the penalty might be? So at least if you get it out now and it's sitting there in Australia, you can leave with nothing and then have some money waiting for you once you get off the plane. Yeah. person owns precious metals and runs a business, do you have any recommendations, pitfalls to avoid if this person would like to uh, you know, start dealing exclusively or more in? Yeah, you can deal in, I mean, you're going to have problems with the IRS or with money laundering when you get into that kind of stuff here. But, I mean, I've already done that. I've got my offshore bank um, has a bullion storage program where we issue to my bank customers a MasterCard that is a debit card that is directly linked to their gold. And they can take the card into any uh, merchant that takes MasterCard or any ATM, and they can withdraw gold or they can spend gold. And, you know, I, 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 you know, it's going to get bigger, I think. I think more people are going to follow my lead. But I don't offer it to Americans because in order to get this card, you have to have an account at my bank. And I won't let Americans open an account at my bank because I don't want my bank to fall under the scrutiny of the U.S. government. And since I'm here in America, they have a lot of leverage over me. And if they thought I was helping Americans hide money, uh, I'd be in some trouble. So what I'm telling the IRS and the SEC or the all these is that no, I, I, I will not do business with any Americans so you don't have to worry. So I'm just, you know, we, we're, we're going to great lengths to make sure that no Americans um, open up accounts with me. But I'm not the only one. As an American, it's very difficult to get a bank account, even if you're living. If you're an American citizen and you're living abroad, most banks won't take your account, even if you live in that country. They don't want to have anything to do with you. I mean, look what we're doing to these Swiss banks. 
I mean, America is like, you know, I mean, it's almost the worst citizenship to have is an American citizenship. Right? I mean, it's, you know, so, I mean, if you have an opportunity, I mean, to, to, to get another one, do it. You know, if you can marry somebody from, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, because, you know, because it, it, it's a good idea. <laughs> and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that, that, that an American citizenship is not like an albatross because it used to be, you know, such a, so, so, so prestigious. It was an honor because being an American meant something. It meant you were free. Doesn't mean that anymore. It basically means you're, you're, you're basically a slave on this, on a, this giant plantation. Uh, given, as you've said, that an American citizenship is now a liability, you're better off going to the communists to run a business and all the things that you've laid out, as many of us have laid out. Do you really see, with all the government violence and coercion laid towards us, a peaceful solution to this problem? <coughs> well, yeah, there are. You know, and it's funny, too, when people compare China to America and they say, hey, China is doing better, so this state-run capitalism must be better than the free market capitalism that we have. I'm like, wait, 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 wait a minute. There's more, there's more state involvement here than there is in China. They've got more of the old fashioned capitalism than we do. So again, it's, we're, we're, we're giving this whole you know, thing a bad name. But yeah, I mean, we can resolve it peacefully. I mean, you, know, you don't know. I mean, who knows, right? Ron Paul could become president. <laughs> So, you know, it, it, you know, it's not like it can't be done. I mean, we wrote these laws. We could repeal them, right? I mean, we, you know, we could get honest judges instead of the ones we got that understand the Constitution, you know. But, I mean, I don't know how to handicap it. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I could chime in just to follow up, I mean, I think that there's so much violence already going on that peaceful solution is almost an oxymoron because there's so much violence being done to us. If we don't respond violently to them, then that's one thing, but a peaceful solution is us getting over the violence that's being done to us. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. And as I said, look, you know, I still live here, so I hope it doesn't get really, you know, really bad. But look, I mean, you, you look at what happens, you look at the, the protests in Greece, and other parts of the world where a dependent society is told they can't have what they thought they were entitled to. There are a lot of Americans that are going to lose what they thought they were entitled to. And a lot of people are going to be looking for someone to blame. I mean, this is the mentality of this, you know, you can see it with the Occupy movement. I mean, somebody is responsible. Somebody, you know, somebody is oppressing me. Somebody is hurting me. And, and, and they're going to look to, to, to blame. And, you know, when, you know, when you're waiting in long lines for gas and food and, you know, tempers flare. So, you know, I mean, things could get pretty violent. And again, you know, it could come from the government, too. I mean, what is the government going to do? You know, they're going to come in and is there going to be martial law? Are they going to have curfews? I mean, what are they going to do? You know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it, this is going to unfold because it's going to hit the fan. This crisis is coming. There is no preventing it. You know, even if we did all the right things, it's going to be very painful in the short run for a large segment of the population. How are they going to react to that? You know, how are people who have been coddled their whole lives, who have been told you got this coming, you got this coming, all of a sudden, no, you don't have anything coming. You got to go work. You know, people don't want to hear that. They, they, they think the government can take care of them. You know, they think, well, you know, just print money. Well, yeah, like, you know, like, like, like it can have any value just because we print it. We have to produce things. If you don't, it's production that gives the money value. Just printing it just makes it worth less. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you know, we look at a lot of the economic plans we have when we equate that to the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, since 1913. When we look at the banking crisis, you know, about 1910 and 1872, I was curious if you equate that to the fractions of our banking system. Well, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with fractions of banking. The problem is when the government subsidizes it and it's, and it's not based in real money. We had fractional reserve banking before we had a Federal Reserve. But the government didn't guarantee the bank deposit. So bankers know, I mean, when you're a banker in a free market, 
The most important thing to you is your credibility, your reputation, because people are entrusting their savings in your bank. And the last thing you want is a run. The last thing you want is people to feel that the money isn't there. So bankers have two forces that they have to balance. One, they want to make as much money as possible, which means they want to make as many loans as possible. But they also want to make sure that they can always pay their depositors their money when they want it. So they kind of have to strike a balance between the, the, the reserves that they hold and the loans that they make. And it's a competitive balance because everybody is competing in the marketplace. And, and so you get a, 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 a pretty fair ratio of reserves to loans in a free market. But when the government comes in and, 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 and guarantees bank deposits, well, now it doesn't matter because none of the depositors care what the hell you do with the money. Because even if you lose it all on some subprime mortgages, the government's got you covered. So there now, the banks would barely keep any reserves. So the government has to come in and set by law, okay, you got to keep the reserves because they knew that now that the moral hazard, they, so, but the government sets the reserve very, very low. And of course, there's no gold at all there. So it's all in a fiat system. And so there's so much money being created. So the problem is in fractional reserve. The problem is the, the paper money and the, 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 the insured deposits. So if we just get government out of banking completely, which is, was the case before 1913, you know, I mentioned all the wealth that was created, all those, the richest Americans, 90% of the wealthiest Americans being born before the Civil War. We didn't have a Federal Reserve. How did people say, well, how, we, we, we couldn't have business. How did these guys, how did Rockefeller, how did Carnegie get so rich without, without a Federal Reserve? without paper, how did he do it? How did they get so rich? Rockefeller, when he died, his net worth is estimated at something like three or four hundred billion dollars. I mean, I mean, Gates and Buffett are only worth 40 or 50 billion. I say only, but compare that to Rockefeller. And, and so, you know, how did, this, how did this work? It worked fine. People always talk about all the problems we had during the 19th century, all the panics. Oh yeah, sure, there were panics, but big deal. You know, look at, look at the progress that we've made. And all those panics can be traced to government intervention. You know, at, you know there was some paper money that was printed uh, during the Civil War, that was the problem. You had, you know, a big coinage of silver. There was, you know, the push for more coins. So, I mean, there was always some manipulation of the money supply where the government played a part in every little boom that eventually bust. But the thing was, whatever we did, we, had, we just marched forward during that century. I mean, we had much more progress in the 19th century than we did in the 20th. By any way you want to measure it, the economy did better in the 19th century under a gold standard without a central bank than it did during the 20th century. And we did better in the first half of the 20th century than in the second half, right? And we're doing lousy so far in the first decade of the 21st century, it's a complete disaster. And you can look at, you can trace the decline to the growth of government. The bigger the government is, the more involved it is in the economy, the worse we do. You know, and this shouldn't be new to anybody. I mean, the founding fathers knew this 200, over 200 years ago. They told us what works and what didn't. All we had to do was follow what their, their, you know, their, their prescription, but we didn't do it. And we did for a while, but you know, we abandoned it. Yeah. Why is the silver to gold ratio so out of whack? Should, should that be 16 to 1? Well, I mean, I don't know. It shouldn't be anything. It is what it is, right? But it was 20 to 1. That's what we fixed it at when we were on a gold and silver by metallic standard. And although it was 20 to 1, and then it was 35 to 1 when, the, when Roosevelt devalued when they move gold up, they didn't change silver. So all of a sudden, but I don't know what it should be. You know, there's, it, it is what it is, but I do think that the ratio will come down in silver's favor over time, just based on reverting to a historic mean. Why is it so out of whack today? I think it's really because we're not on a gold standard. I mean, everybody is on a fiat standard. 
And, and I think there is more demand as people are now looking for hedges. And since we're not using gold or silver in commerce, and you know, certainly silver lends itself to commerce more than gold for small transactions. Although now that you can do things like my debit card, you know, an idea that I had when I was talking to the guy that was running for governor, what New Hampshire could do if they wanted to legally is, you know, they can take their tax receipts and they can buy gold and they can store it. Uh, and the state can issue all its employees debit cards and load their salary up on those cards, hire them for gold. Uh, this job pays an ounce of gold a week. This job pays a half an ounce a week. This job pays 1.2 ounces. And every week they can load that up on a debit card. And then the state employee can take that card to an ATM machine and get cash if he wants, or he can take it to a merchant. And the merchants can actually sign up too for a program and say, hey, I want an account with the state depository. And when people come in and buy my stuff, I want the payment to stay in gold, and then they can just switch it. So, I mean, a state can just get on its gold standard if it wants, legally, and everybody can start using gold very simply. The only problem would be the federal government. But then maybe if you have a governor that stands up to the federal government and says, look, if you don't respect the Constitution, we're, we're out of here. You know, we're not going to let, we're not going to stand, we're not going to stay a part of this union if you're not abiding by the Constitution. I mean, New Hampshire signed the Constitution. It was ratified based on... The, the idea that the federal government was going to be very small and, and mind its own business. And New Hampshire said, federal government, here are your powers. And we're agreeing to join this union because you're going to abide by this constitution. And if the government is going to operate outside the constitution, then New Hampshire could say, well, then we're not in it anymore. So, you know, I know I talked about that earlier, but what, what was your question? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. I think because it's not really in commerce, I think that you know central banks hold gold. They don't hold any silver. So you have more investment demand for gold than silver. And silver is also has more of an industrial component to it. Uh, so it's not seen as the, the pure play that gold is. Um, but I do believe ultimately that it's going to go higher. I mean, you look at a chart. I mean, silver is looking really strong right now. I think it's headed up to 40 bucks very quickly. Uh, eventually it's going to go to 50, back where it hit the high, and then it's going to break out, and then you'll probably, you know, you might never see 50 again. I mean, you might a couple times, and I think it'll just take off. Um, you know, kind of like when the Dow broke through 1,000. You know, uh, I think it's going a lot higher. And if you look, if you trace the beginning of the bull market, silver was like three, four bucks. So, I mean, so it, it, it's, it's gone up a lot more than gold. Uh, and I think that's going to continue, but it has been a bumpier ride. So that's, you know, that I think that you're going to have bigger appreciation in silver, but with greater volatility. That's, that's my, but I, I recommend that people own both. I own silver and gold and I own platinum too. Um, and, you know, so, you know, you can own different precious metals. In fact, platinum right now is cheaper than gold. Or I think I just saw it starting to come up, so it might not be. But historically, platinum has a pretty big premium. I remember one time when platinum got up to 2,000 and gold was still at 1,000. So I mean, within the precious metals, you can always try to, you know, look at the, you know, the relative relationships and and buy the ones that look cheap. Yeah. Last question. Okay. Yeah. Come on. So this is kind of All right, right. Two more questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. So, in bond market, and also relating to silver market, there are different investment opportunities, like you know, stocks, bonds, silver, different time periods. So, thinking like 1979 to 1981, and what happened there with the the the, the up with the price of gold going to 800, then back down to what 381. Uh, so, bond yield curve, you've got 30-year Treasury uh, on the numerator, you know. Uh, uh, three-month treasury denominator, then you've got the ratio over time, and uh, right now it's, it's going you know, way up. They're spiking it with the so-called twist, right? Isn't that what they refer to, the bond yield curve, when they yeah. refer to the twist of the numerator? And the yeah, well, I talked about this earlier today, on, the, but yeah, right now the Federal Reserve is buying 92% of all the bonds that mature 10 years or later. So the Federal Reserve is pretty much single-handedly propping up the bond market. And if it wasn't for the Federal Reserve, Congress would have to cut spending because interest rates would be too high 
to finance the deficit. So because the Fed is cooperative, and instead of being independent and, and, and protecting our currency, they are facilitating the deficits and, and, and monetizing them. Uh, but that's part of this bubble that I talked about earlier that's going to burst is this, this final bubble, this government bubble. Our whole economy right now is completely dependent on 0% interest rates. And the minute interest rates go up, we will have a bigger economic collapse than 2008, which is why the Fed won't raise them, because the Fed knows how vulnerable the economy is, how it's completely unsustainable. It is a complete you know, illusion. We, ha we, ha we, ha we have a phony economy that can only exist so long as the Fed can keep it artificially, you know, uh, you know, resuscitated, you know, and it's, it's got it on its life support. But the problem is it has to die. This, this economy cannot perpetuate because the longer it exists, the worse it gets because we're, we're, we're just digging ourselves into a deeper hole. And the longer we wait to confront the problems, the bigger the problems get and the harder it is to solve them. So the day of reckoning is coming. The further into the future we deal with it, the more painful it's going to be. The good news is we don't got that much time. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I think it's going to. I look, we don't we don't have five years. We, we might not even have three. I don't know. I mean, we might. Something's going to happen soon because you can see what's going on in Europe. We're next. To, to avoid yeah. like a 1981, do you think when the bond yield curve goes below one, the ratio of one, and once you go under, that's maybe the sell point? Because there's buy and sell, so we bought, we bought silver. Sell what? Silver, maybe. Well, I'm not even. I'm not thinking about when to sell my silver. It's not even close. You know, I mean, what we're really going to need is going to be high real interest rates, a Fed that's committed to reining in inflation. But that means a Fed that's also committed to letting banks fail and letting the government default on its debt. Because the only way to stop gold and silver from going up is going to be a default. But if the government doesn't default, then I know gold and silver are going up. Because the only way we avoid default is massive inflation. That's it. There's no way to honestly repay our debts. So either we have to default on them or we're going to inflate. So if you think our politicians are going to act responsibly, well, then maybe you need to sell your gold or your silver. <laughs> but if you think they're not, if you think they're going to keep on acting, you know, uh, in doing what's politically expedient, well, then you want to keep buying. Yeah. Last question. Listen, I, I really love your father's liberty activism. Thank you. His, his 84th birthday was yesterday. Unfortunately, he's spending it in, in prison. He and many other people I consider very intelligent have done the legal research and have been telling me, and I believe as well from the research I've done, that in fact the IRS has no liability, or the people have no liability to pay federal income tax. And, and I say that if we get the right governor in New Hampshire, and in fact, we can Tenth Amendment this thing mm -hmm. and, and keep the friggin' money in New Hampshire. And yeah. But also, get out from under the workman's comp and the minimum wage and, man, and, and all the mandates and all the, you know, all the, 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 the legal liabilities on the employers, you know, all these, you know, all, if, if, if you, the government has no right, the federal government has no right to tell a private employer who to hire, who to fire, how to pay them, what to pay them, you know, you know, what, whether they have a health insurance, workman's comp, what the working conditions are. It's none of the federal government's business. If I want to hire somebody and they want to work for me, that's it. The terms are negotiated between the parties. Now, if the state, if the state wants to try to do something, but the federal government, what does the federal government have to do with a grocery store in New Hampshire? I mean, and it doesn't matter if I want to sell homogenized milk, non-homogenized milk, you know, what, who cares? If I, if I want to, if I, if my customers want to suck the milk directly out of the cow's udders, <laughs> what difference is it, what is it made for the government?
know, as I said, look, I would love to see a state do it, you know, but as I said, it didn't work out too well last time, you know, but I mean, look, Texas has it in it. When Texas joined the United States, because they joined, you know, late, they knew, so they joined and they specifically said, we're joining, but we have the right to leave whenever we want. That's in there. Why, you know, <laughs> so who knows? Because I'd love to, the country of Texas wouldn't be bad, neither would the country, I mean, you know, neither would the country in New Hampshire. Yeah, I mean, there's some, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know, I live in Connecticut. If Connecticut seceded, I, I wouldn't want to stay there. <laughs> or New York, I mean, some. <laughs> I, I thought it was going to end on putting your mouth on an udder. <laughs> so right, thank you, Peter Schiff. By the way, you guys should know that Peter did. I'm only going to talk for 10 minutes tonight. So two quick announcements is uh, Silver Circle. Where's Megan Duffield? You guys all know Crazy Megan? Silver Circle is going to have a preview of their movie downstairs in the amphitheater. It's like a 10, 15 minute clip. There will be scenes from New Hampshire that were filmed. And there's one awesome scene with a special hidden clip with a special logo some of you guys know. And then after that, Will Buchanan. Do I see you? Do you guys know who Will Buchanan is? He's so crazy, he walked across the country. And then they made a movie about it. So Libertopia, we will, will be going to talk about Libertopia, and Libertopia will be after Silver Circle, downstairs in the amphitheater, and like, we're going to start in like five, ten minutes. So thank you, Europac, uh, for coming out. Thank you, Peter. It was fantastic having you here. I'll see you all tomorrow morning.